Hello and welcome to everyone who's tuned in online. We're starting a new course, uh, it's called Music Under Stalin. And there are just a few words I would like to say about the course in general at first. So, why am I so interested in this period? I've already devoted quite a few years of my life to researching various aspects of it. Well, there are a few interesting issues here. One conundrum is that uh, it was a horrible time, sometimes a tragic time. Um, so many um, terrible things happened. There was mass arrests and executions going on. People were living in fear, uh, and yet there is so much wonderful music comes from that time that we still like listening to. And it would be probably easier to explain if that music was written in resistance to the regime. But quite a lot of it is on the contrary, was approved by the regime and uh, welcomed and uh, got prizes and performances and so on. Yeah? So um, how do we uh, deal with that conundrum? Uh, another issue here is, of course, the issue that if we were still living uh, within the Cold War period, um, everything would be easy for us to explain that, you know, freedom goes with modernism and composers who were free really expressed themselves freely in this, uh, in this way, sometimes writing works that were challenging, uh, that were... I don't know, yeah, that, that really maybe even some, something unpleasant, yeah, but, but they were challenging uh, and uh, moving uh, move music forward. And on the other side, you had uh, music written um, under duress, yeah, music that was more conservative, more palatable, more beautiful, more melodic, um, and so we would reject this music. If we were still yeah, during the Cold War and we were on the Western side, yeah, we would treat it with disdain, as much of socialist realism, yeah, the so-called socialist realism was treated. But these days, somehow, the stock of this really harsh modernist music has gone down a bit, yeah, so because the audiences usually prefer, actually, sometimes to listen uh, to something that sounds nicer and more beautiful and more eternal. The final thing that I would say is that for me, of course, it was always a personal quest because I'm the child of the perestroika and uh, for me, learning about that time was something very important because I thought the more we understand how things worked and how things got so bad so quickly and how the whole population participated in, in these horrors, uh, the better we understand it, the, the better we will manage to prevent it from happening again. Uh, and certainly when I came to this country, everyone was treating it as a very exotic subject. Yeah, things like that can never happen here. Yes, we have the robust parliamentary system. I remember what people were, used to tell me. Yeah, but the, the, the more you go on, I mean, it's sad to say, but you realize that it's actually an illusion. And things can go downhill very quickly, and I think we've... Um, I remember sort of shuddering when I saw on the front page of a British newspaper um, a, a headline which said enemies, yeah, enemies of the people or enemies of the state, something like that. Enemies of the people, I think it was, yeah, which of course was one of these very Stalinist labels that got people killed. So, uh, so I hope that you, it, it will still act as a kind of warning, a yeah, collective warning to all of us. So, uh, lecture number one will be devoted to two people. One of them you know very well. I chose particularly decadent pictures of them. Um, and uh, this is Dmitry Shostakovich, yeah, wearing a bow tie, and Alexander Masalov, whom you probably know slightly less, and everyone knows slightly less. But they had a very interesting careers, which ran parallel for a while and then diverged sharply. So I think it will be very interesting to compare them. So we're going to be talking about the 1920s. But before we uh, talk about that, let's just you know, say a few things about Bolshevism and modernism. Yeah, so what happened in the first years after the 1917 Bolshevik Revolution? So, of course, a lot of artists who were very closely aligned with the upper classes, yeah, with uh, the bourgeois art, emigrated, and you know their names. But there were some radical artists who actually saw this as an opportunity. 
yes, because they were marginalized before the revolution. And now suddenly, yeah, by collaborating with the regime, they could promote their own art, promote their own ideas, their own careers. And this is something, uh, was, was something very exciting for them, especially since culture actually was quite well financed in those first years. Yeah, so many things were expropriated. Yeah, palaces, all these wonderful venues where you could play music, uh, all these Stradivari violins and so on that became part of the national collections and so on. Yeah, so th there was quite a lot of these um, ill-gotten money uh, flashing around and um, uh, some of the, of the culture certainly got that because it was understood from the very start that culture was extremely important, yeah, and high culture in particular. Uh, there were two main ideas, I suppose, of what the new revolutionary art uh, had to be like. And one was that it was supposed to be radical, revolutionary in itself. Yeah, so actually challenge all the previous art. Let's throw uh, all the uh, previous artists yeah, from the ship of modernity and start completely afresh. Mm. And the other idea of revolutionary art, that it should be uh, should be accessible to the proletarians and peasants, yeah, that they now have become the main people um, in, the, in the new Soviet state. So, as you can see, they were directly direct opposites of, of each other. Yeah, so some artists would say, we're writing revolutionary music, and they would do something very complex and eternal and dissonant, hoping that you know, in a few years' time, the proletariat will grow to like it, and sometimes they did like it straight away. And uh, on the other hand, you had people yeah, who claimed to speak for the proletarians who wanted to write just you know, very cheerful marches, music that was very simple, very tonal, yeah, very attractive straight away, didn't require any study. So uh, just to see uh, that uh, you probably know these, these famous photos, yeah, there was a group of painters uh, in Vitebsk, um, uh, Kazimir Malevich, El Lisitsky, and Mark Chagall. Yeah, he were allowed to do all kinds of things, um, including uh, you know, decorating uh, street, the streets of the city with this new art. Yeah, so if you can see, this is probably a machine gun, yeah, uh, but, but it all may, made out of geometric figures. Yeah, so, um, or things like that, that were happening in, in theater, of several at my hold, yeah, also um, produced uh, very revolutionary pieces with a lot of, kind of audience participation, a lot of topical references, and it was all done in these remarkably striking yeah, modernist sets. But musicians at that time, in these first years, didn't really do very much anything, uh, sorry, didn't do very much that was quite as noticeable. Yeah, there are no, no direct parallels to Mayhold and Malevich. Uh, they um, came to, to be more interesting, I suppose, and, and um, avant-garde by about uh, 1926. Uh, or oh, just to show you another, <laughs> I will show you quite a lot of visual art in this, in this presentation that I'd like you to know. So this is Pavel Filonov from 1931. Yeah, it's called the Lenin's Plan of State Electrification of Russia. Yeah, so you can see where he uses his own analytical art, his own very strange technique. Yeah, and then you have a face of Lenin suddenly uh, appearing. So... Uh, as I said, musicians joined these movements a little bit later, and it happened uh, during the time of NEP, um, which was the new economic policy um, proposed by Lenin in 1921, really taking off from 1923. When some private enterprise was allowed, yeah, small, for example, private publishing, books and music, and also some foreign trade war was restored. And this was extremely important yeah, because all the new scores, modernist scores, suddenly flooded into the Soviet Union. There was a special um, agreement between uh, the Vienna publishing house, Universal Edition, yeah, and uh, state music publishers in the Soviet Union. So suddenly uh, you had uh, all kinds of people uh, even coming uh, to, um, to Russia 
and staging their operas or staging their, their concerts, playing their concerts. These are some of them. These are some of the visitors. Yeah, so Darius Miu and Artu Anaguer, so two of the French six. Uh, Alfredo Caselli, Italian composer, Paul, uh, uh, Paul Hindemith, yeah, who were the kind of new classicists um, on either side. Yeah, the German and the Italian type. Bella Barta came. Yeah, they all played their music, and that was extremely uh, influential. Uh, most, <laughs> uh, probably, interestingly, Alban Berg also came uh, for just a few days to, to Leningrad when his opera Wozzeck was staged. And he is he's pictured on that date, 13th of June, I think, uh, 27. So at that point, uh, Leningrad really became one of the international centers for modernist music. And uh, this is uh, uh, another, this is a set design for another opera which became extremely um, popular. This was Der Sprung über der Schatten, the satire on, of the Western society. So you can see uh, people dancing foxtrot. So, you know, they meant it satirically, but it was also very pleasant to watch and nice to listen to. Yeah, so they sort of killed two birds with, with one stone. Uh, and uh, this is a, a, a program, signed program. This is a, a great kind of scene from, from that opera. Uh, and this is a program which is signed by people like Stanislavski, if you can see, so it's just under the title, and also by Alban Berg, who says, uh, this, this is a program they sent to Krenek, uh, you've got to see this, you've got to come and see this. Yes, yeah, so it's kind of amazing, yeah, that uh, so uh, only what's, nine years after the revolution, you suddenly have Leningrad emerging as this, this absolutely burgeoning uh, place for modernist culture. Now, uh, I'm not going to introduce Shostakovich to you because you know him very well, uh, but what I was going to say, that they, they started writing their really uh, experimental music uh, at the same time, yeah, in 1926. This was the time when all these people were coming and, and playing their music, and they really absorbed all, every single kind of trend that was on offer. Yeah, so that was a real change. Uh, if you compare what Shostakovich did just, you know, a few months earlier in his first symphony, which become by, became, by the way, very, very popular uh, all, all over the world, and what he does yeah, uh, in, in his second symphony, it's, it's a huge gap, and that's, what, that's why this happens. And Masalov also arrives on the, on the scene in 1926. Now, who was Masalov? I mean, if you've heard his name, and if you've heard one piece, I know which piece it probably is. It's a piece which is in Russian called Zavod, and uh, I'll translate it as the Iron Foundry. Um, so, uh, it's the piece uh, that has a subtitle, Music of the Machines, yeah, and it's really supposed to present uh, the, the beautiful noise, the beautiful music that was coming from, from the machines um, in the factory. Uh, so let us hear a little bit of that, the very beginning of it. Hear yeah, all these noises. Some of them quite unpleasant, yeah, but they uh, very evocative of a factory, yeah, of an iron foundry. And uh, now we'll probably have to, to go slightly down, yeah, in the level of music because we're going to hear the ending of that um, piece, uh, which of course is going to get louder and louder, as you can guess. Uh, and more sort of gl glorificatory with, with the brass section going on and something else in the orchestra. And I've chosen the performance where you can see what is happening. Yeah, it uh, doesn't happen in every video, so this is specifically for you to see something. <laughs>
could see the, the steel sheet, they are being shaken, and also uh, you could probably hear the siren as well, yeah, which is another unusual instrument that he adds to the symphony orchestra. So um, I'm going to tell you a few more things about Masalov. So he was born in 1900, so it's easy yeah, to, to count how old he was at, at what stage. And his mother was an opera singer at the Bolshoi, um, and his stepfather was a, quite an important um, painting teacher. He was not such a good painter when you look at his paintings, yeah, but he had a private painting school. So they were very well off, very privileged. And Masalov was sent to a very good school. Uh, he had um, governors, you know, when he was a child, who taught him to speak German and French fluently. Mm, and uh, his family traveled abroad. Uh, so uh, then, yeah, the revolution happened, and the teenager Masalov, uh, his rebellion is to run away to fight with the Red Army. Yeah, so that is quite, <laughs> quite a striking thing to do. And apparently, I mean, we, we always have to be a bit careful of what people say about their biography during these year, years because they sometimes exaggerate, but at least he claimed that he met Lenin himself, personally delivered packages to him, yeah, and so on and so forth. So he actually didn't start professional, professional study of music until he was 21. He went to the Moscow Conservatoire to study both piano and composition, yeah, the same way as Shostakovich, and Shostakovich was in Leningrad, yeah, which was then Petrograd. Yeah. So um, uh, they're kind of parallel careers, although Shostakovich was a prodigy, yeah, so he started more or less at the same time, but, but he was much younger, and Masalov had already you know, fought at the front. And uh, even at that time, uh, very soon, uh, very quickly, Masalov you know, becomes a fully-fledged composer and composer of some not notoriety. I, I think he had the talent to be notorious, to be noticed, to be outrageous. Uh, so that as early as 1925, uh, Nikolai Bukharin, who was the closest ally of Stalin at the time, actually mentions him as in one of his articles, and he says that this guy obviously uh, is alien to our Soviet music. Uh, although Bukharin had never heard a note of Masalov, but he just read something about him. But, you know, so he was, he was scolded by Bukharin, which I, I suppose was a big deal. Although when you think of it, if he was praised by Bukharin, that probably wouldn't have worked for him well either, yeah, because Biharin in 1929 was demoted from the Politburo and later on he was arrested and executed. So um, <laughs> it, it, it's hard to say, isn't it? Uh, uh, so um, you can see him, yeah, in him is more decadent portrait and he's more kind of working class, yeah, wear, wearing a cap portrait in, in 1930. Uh, so um, there was also another group of people that he annoyed very much, and that group of people, I will refer to them as proletarian composers, although they weren't actually proletarian themselves. But they certainly spoke for the proletariat. They knew alone, they alone knew, they claimed what proletarians, uh, what music they wanted. Yeah, so they were the kind of people who would, would write uh, marches yeah, and, and simple songs and thought this is what proletarian music should be like. So they uh, really chose Masalov as their whipping boy at that point. And Masalov wrote quite a lot of naughty pieces at that time. For example, this one is called The Four Newspaper Announcements. And they are real, true newspaper announcements. They're very short. Yeah, and uh, setting them to music wasn't a particularly new idea because Eisler did it first in 1921. But nevertheless, Masalov actually does it in a more, more fun way. So uh, this is an example. Yeah, the, the dog, a dog has run away, and then there's a description of the dog. You know, it's a bitch. You know, it's white. It has this coffee-colored stain. You know, please, uh, you know, don't uh, don't buy it if somebody offers to sell it to you.
That's it. Yeah, that's a song. <laughs> very, very short. Uh, I'll show you the start of the last one because I think it's particularly funny. Um, it's about a pest controller yeah, who kills rats. Yeah, so, but the funny thing is here is that it's a, uh, it's a funeral march. <laughs> so this is what it, uh, it sounds like. Christmas So, you know, very ironic, uh, modernist irony, we're familiar with that, so the proletarian musicians didn't like that. Uh, now, very important landmark in both Shostakovich's and Masalov's life was 1927, and there's a particular concert in which they presented their own revolutionary works. So it was 10 tenth, tenth years, 10th tenth anniversary of October, yes, yeah, so a very uh, well publicized concert. And uh, Shostakovich uh, brought his new work to it, which was called the Second Symphony, or the alternative title was Two October, yes, yeah, kind of symphonic poem, Two October. So it was a dedication to the 10th anniversary. Uh, and uh, Masalov brought uh, his. Iron Foundry, which you've already heard, and this was what the critics said, and this is interesting that it's a positive criticism, yeah, it says that uh, towards the end, yeah, these uh, mighty melodic rhythmic figures began to sound so victorious and uplifting, especially when the brass add their sustained chords of the, uh, over the rhythmic melodic background, that this vivid overture, while losing none of its illustrative character, is transformed into a mighty hymn of, to mechanized labor. Yeah, so it's, it's expressed in these ideological terms, which go very well with the drive for industrialization yeah, and glorification of, of people who actually work in the iron foundry. So that was 1927, and the, the critic in question actually later became a member of RAPM, or RAPM, I will refer to it, yes, the Russian Association of Proletarian Musicians. So we will see that two years later he wouldn't have written anything like that. Yes, so at this point, Masalov still, and, and this piece, is being seen as something very positive. Uh, now let's have a look at Shostakovich's uh, Second Symphony. So that's also a revolutionary piece. It was a commission, and uh, he was given a text which he disliked. Yeah, he thought the text was completely trite and horrible. Uh, he didn't have a particular sort of desire to set that text, but he was thinking of the fee uh, that he might spend by going to Paris. Yeah, so he writes in one of the letters to, to his friend, yes, I, you know, the text is horrible, but I keep thinking, to Paris, to Paris. <laughs> so you can see that even at this stage, yeah, Shostakovich writing this official work is not yeah, completely sincere. He is basically following um, the, the rules of the commission. But he also writes one of uh, most in the face, uh, in your face, um, avant-garde pieces. Uh, he begins it uh, with basically a musical, not a musical, but a, a presentation of a noise, something very dark, something very slow moving. Uh, and that's a representation of a dark past, yeah, so before the revolution. This is how things were. You can see how it, how it works. Yeah, he starts with double basses who play in crotchets, yeah, and then you have uh, cellos coming in in quavers. Yeah, and then ev every next uh, part comes in in smaller, 
um, node values. Yeah, so gradually it grows, but it grows in a very amorphous way because it's all atonal. Yeah, there's no tonality. Uh, everything is vague. There's also no r perceptible rhythm precisely because all the, all the different node values are uh, mixed together. And towards the end, uh, the, the choir will come in, yeah, and that will be a moment of some kind of brightening yeah, and more sort of revolutionary pathos. <laughs> And at the very end, you even have declamation, choral declamation. So you probably heard there was a siren there as well. Um, yeah, so there's a siren and there's a, like a reprise of the first material, but which is now going towards this tonic triad, which turns out to be a B major triad, not a C major triad, a kind of very scrabbiness B major triad with five sharps in the key signature. Yeah, so unusual key. Yeah, and it all ends suddenly tonally. Yeah, so you go from atonality to tonality from from horrible darkness yeah, to collective happiness. And uh, the words that they were shouting were October, the Commune, and Lenin. So you can, you can imagine. Yeah, so, um, uh, so somebody was, used to joke that he went in, in the space of one symphony from being uh, belonging to this contemporaneous type of composers yeah, who were following bourgeois trends to a proletarian composer at the end. Yeah, so it, the, the, the two sides, the two poles of uh, Soviet music at that time are basically combined in a single piece. So, uh, interestingly, yeah, the, this uh, 1927 event uh, really made Shostakovich's revolutionary career. You know, it began it, it gave him these revolutionary credentials. It was a very important work, which I think was never denounced, um, although maybe it wasn't played quite as much later on. Yeah, so it actually was a positive thing for him, while for Masalov, despite this positive criticism, Zavod, yeah, the Iron Finery became the piece which uh, was, was criticized then later very negatively, yeah, as something bourgeois, because uh, they claimed it didn't actually represent the people who were working the machines. It was just representing the noises. And how do we know that the factory that he is portraying is a socialist factory? How do we know it's not a capitalist factory? Yeah, and so on and so forth. So it, it's interesting yeah, how they are sort of starting to diver diverge here. Uh, one more uh, e extravagantly avant-garde piece that Shostakovich writes next year in 1928 is his opera, The Nose. And that, of course, um, comes from his uh, collaborations and his friendship with the great theater director that I already mentioned, several Meyerhold. Uh, it so happened that Meyerhold was um, invited Shostakovich to be a pianist in his theater and sort of took him under his wing. Shostakovich became a bit of a protege and actually uh, stayed in Meyerhold's apartment and even wrote the nose there. Yeah, and when Myhold had a fire in his apartment, Myhold saved the score. Yeah, so this is just a lovely story uh, that's connected to that. So uh, Myhold was, of course, um, uh, a, a proponent of anti-realist theater. So when you were in his shows, you were never allowed to forget yeah, to be immersed in the action, to, to forget that you are in the theater. You are constantly drawn into the action yourself. So it involved uh, aspects of circus, yeah, or all kinds of acrobatics, or maybe ballet, you know, there were choreographed movement, uh, there was improvisation, all kinds of things, you know, and including questions to the audience and so on. So, 
uh, Shostakovich was extremely impressed by this type of theater, in particular with one production, which was of Gogol's um, Government Inspector, yeah, very famous production. So he also decided to do something on Gogol, and he used this uh, story, which is called The Nose. When an ordinary person, Major Kovalev, wakes up one day and doesn't find anything on his face that resembles the nose, the nose is gone. Yeah, and then uh, from this uh, beginning, you have a, a whole series of adventures where he's trying to find it. And you realize that he is going to be humiliated at every point. So, you know, you can, you can have many interpretations of what this actually means. You know, there are obviously very naughty sexual references there yeah, about losing, you know, nose or something else. And Shostakovich being only, uh, what, 22 at the time, yeah, was, was very naughty in that respect too. But they're also, uh, I think, this opera is also very much about the, the system of ranks, yeah, the bureaucracy, and the humiliation, ritual humiliation that you experience going from, uh, from one place to another. Yeah, it's like a Kafkian, really, world. Uh, so there in this opera, uh, you have uh, a whole lot of very new things, some possibly done for the first time or at the same time as various Western composers did it. For example, there is an, an entr'acte, yeah, so music between the acts, which consists only of percussion, unpitched percussion. So basically it's just a huge racket. So he also wanted to be very loud, just like Masalov. Yeah, so they're bashing the instruments for about four minutes. Yeah, it's kind of almost unbearable. I'm sure some people probably left. Uh, then there are these, these things also incredibly um, uh, sort of avant-garde, yeah, done for the first time, cutting edge, like the octet of janitors. This is also has to do, interestingly, with newspaper announcements. Yes, yeah, so the same idea. So uh, they are all um, reading out their, their little snitches, snatches yeah, of newspaper announcements, but they're doing it at the same time, syllable by syllable, so that's absolutely impossible to follow any text. Yeah? And in fact, text becomes superfluous. It just becomes kind of phonetic rubbish. Yeah? It's nothing. And that is also, that's something, I don't know, avant-garde composers did that with the electronic music, I think, in the 50s, or something similar, yeah? sort of removing all meaning from the text. But of course, there were also poets uh, who were doing it at the same time, yeah? trying to write poetry that was simply simply phonetic, yeah, it didn't actually have any meaning. So this is what it happened, what, what it sounds like. So it's an eight part atonal canon, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but um, you, you can't, of course, hear any any. Uh, words and uh, so part of the parts of the opera are parodies of of conventional opera. Yeah, so usually in ensemble, in operatic ensembles, you also can't understand any words. Yeah, so he just takes this to some kind of absurd point of absurdity, or for example, using uh, very high melismatic writing yeah, without words, sometimes virtuosic writing to portray the nose, the nose, yeah, who walks on his own and talks, and he also wears a uniform which is of a higher rank than his owner. Yes, so that, that's a funny thing. So this is a little bit of the dialogue. <laughs> Объяснить 
So he wrote it in 1928, which was still uh, quite a, a liberal time. But by the time it got to be staged, it was already a very different situation in 1930. And uh, it, it actually got quite bad reviews as well. Yeah, so as you can see, that it's totally beyond me, as one critic says. What interest or instruction the students of the metal or the metal or textile workers who populate the opera boxes could draw from watching crowds of people rushing across the stage for several hours looking for their lost nose. Our theater demands spectacles that are ideological and socially significant. Yeah, so Shostakovich here has undoubtedly moved away from the mainstream of Soviet art. Yeah, so that's, as you see, Daniel Zhitomorsky writing in Proletarian Musician, which was the main organ of the Proletarian Museum, uh, musician, uh, musicians who um, uh, were very much in power during these years. So I just wanted to tell you a little bit about that period, and I call it the dire years of rap and rule, because really, uh, there's no other way um, you can objectively describe it. Uh, because it was really the time when these proletarian musicians um, achieved a lot of power. Stalin comes to power in 1929. Yeah? So this is the moment when Stalin actually yeah, assumes this um, power. Before that, it was kind of more or less collective leadership. And he starts uh, trying to... Um, uh, organize culture, I suppose, a little bit. Yeah, there's a min new ministry created and so on. But for now, the ideological leadership uh, of the arts is given away to these proletarianist groups. Yeah, so they're, they were not just musicians, they were also writers, they were also painters and so on. And they really, uh, they couldn't really create very much themselves. This is why we don't know their names. But um, they certainly persecuted everyone who could. And the idea of proletarian culture became so narrow um, that you had to throw out all the bourgeois culture altogether. Yeah, for example, you had to stop playing all, almost all of the canonic Western music and Russian music as well. All the Western classics, all the Russian classics. There were only three exceptions to that. Yeah, so the, the only three figures who survived that period was Beethoven, because he wrote revolutionary music, as we know, uh, was Schubert, because he wrote Dicho and the Miller, and yeah, so it, it was writing about the lives of working people, the Miller. And they also wrote things that were called songs, yeah, which were also some kind of a, a good thing. And Mussorgsky, yes, who was writing people's dramas. So uh, the rest of the repertoire was, was very suspect and almost, almost couldn't be played. So um, during that time, um, Salov uh, writes some pieces which are very much to very topical ideologically. For example, one of them was discovered very recently uh, in 2017. Um, 2017 was the first performance of it. It's called Anti-Religious Symphony or Anti-Religious Symphonic Poem. And uh, I'll just give you a few fragments from it. But before that, I wanted you to, um, to look at what was going on at the same time in 1931. So this is the blowing up of the great cathedral in Moscow, yeah, the Cathedral of Christ the Savior. I'll actually turn the music off here for a moment. Yeah, so you can guess why anti-religious symphony, yeah? because there was this, this drive to really uh, completely exterminate the Russian Orthodoxy at the time. So what happens in this piece? Um, you have uh, people singing various church chants, uh, familiar Russian church Orthodox chants, um, I mean, can't point with each other. And then some people trying to disrupt this, yeah, with the sort of drunken songs and the accordions playing and so on. Yeah, so we seem out of that time. Uh, let's just hear a little bit of that. <laughs>
wanted to show you that there's a little bit of um, uh, poetry that he uses here uh, as well for your delectation. Uh, and also um, this poetry that is declaimed. So but together with all that, you have various revolutionary songs as well. Yeah, so you, you switch from, from chant to these revolutionary songs. So this is the good music coming in. And you, you, the, the, today, of course, you think, well, you know, why even revive this thing? You know, it's kind of horrible. Um, but um, Shostakovich was doing the same. Yeah, he wrote the Bali, the Golden Age, where he also tried to present yeah, the bourgeois society through all the foxtrots and waltzes and so on. And then the good music, the proletarian music. So, and you know, then he wrote a ballet about saboteurs, which is called the Bolt and so on. So he is also very much uh, part of this. The difference is that although Shostakovich was criticized, Masalov was, was basically wiped out at that time. None of this music was performed during the, the rap and period. Uh, none of it was published. Yeah, so it, it's some, something that, that he did uh, that really irritated them so much that he was completely, what well, we would say now, cancelled. But it's much worse than this, as, as you will find out later. So uh, the golden age that I just mentioned uh, also brought Shostakovich into trouble. Because of this music, which you might recognize as Tahiti Trot, yeah? Which wasn't even Shostakovich's. Yeah, it was orchestrate, uh, orchestration of a number from a musical, from an American musical. So Shostakovich was accused of peddling this light music, light bourgeois music, uh, and he had to write to the proletarian musician, which I suppose was the kind of Twitter of the time, um, and say, well, actually, it's not me. It's the conductor, Malko, who is to blame because he took it out of context. He took it out of my ballet and now he's playing it separately. And therefore, the satire that I wanted to present of the bourgeois society is not visible. And people are just enjoying the music. Yes? So, so he pushed the blame onto Malko. And then Malko replied in the next issue and said, how dare you, Shostakovich, do this to me. But somehow, they still remained friends. But uh, this is what's happening. Yes, yeah, so you, he already at that time started to write these apologetic letters. This, this was part of, the, uh, part of the, the time. Well, with Masalov, things were... Uh, the, the kind of letter, letter that Masalov write, wrote was, was very different, and it was a brave, very brave thing to do. And uh, um, as a bonus from this lecture, when you get your transcript, uh, you will find... Um, me and my husband will put together a translation of this, this letter as a whole, so you can read it as a whole thing. I think it's a riveting reading, even though it goes, goes on for too long. But uh, this is just the conclusion of it, and you can see he he's, sets, sets it out in no uncertain terms. You know, either you have to, uh, to sh shut up these, these rappen dogs, you know, the hounds of rappen, uh, and give me some work, because my, n n none of my music is published or performed, or let me go abroad, because by that stage, Masalov's pieces, such as the Iron Foundry and the Quartet and a few others, actually became very well known in Europe. Yes, and uh, so he really could, could count on some kind of fame. And of course, this is very interesting, yeah, that at that point, people realized that you have to write to Stalin to make any decision taken. Yeah, if, if your life has, has written, reached this point of, of no return, you really need intervention from above. Yeah, this kind of godlike intervention. He was not the only one 
Uh, Mikhail Bulgakov, the writer, also wrote a letter to Stalin also um, uh, around this time. And uh, um, Evgeny Zamatin, another writer, yeah, who wrote the letter to Stalin. Zamatin was actually let out and he left uh, the, the country. You know, Bulgakov stayed and was given a job. And uh, after, a month after Masalov's letter, uh, the proletarian musicians were disbanded yeah, and everyone rejoiced. Now, we'll, we'll, we'll know what will happen later, but for, the, for now it was a great uh, victory and a lot of uh, Moscow musicians actually thought that it was Masalov who brought it about because this letter was, was well known, widely known. So this, this is what, who was now in charge. Now, since we're going to talk about Shostakovich for many lectures, almost in every lecture probably, uh, I'm just going to um, talk about Masalov, and it's a, it's a little rather uh, sorrowful last chapter, uh, what happens to him later. So, uh, in, we don't know very much about the intervening period. For some reason, he uh, didn't actually... Uh, get very much benefit from, from this victory yeah, in the war with the proletarian musicians. He went to Central Asia, he collected uh, music, folk music there, and started writing a, an oratorio, Turkmen song um, for Stalin, yeah, so something very ideologically correct. But uh, in the 18th, of or the 18th of September 1937, there was an article about him in uh, Izvesti, in one of the central newspapers, that basically claimed that he was a drunk and disorderly person all the time, yeah, and behaved inappropriately. And at that point, yeah, this was the year of the Great Purge, any kind of denunciation, any kind of accusation could have turned political. So it might be connected that two months later, yeah, he was arrested. And he was sentenced uh, by, by this, you know, three people as a court, these, these very temporary courts that were set up to eight years in the camps for counter-revolutionary propaganda. And we don't know what that meant, whether it actually had anything to do with his music or not. And sent to the Volga camp to fell trees and uh, was extremely lucky to be released, not, not eight years, but eight months later, uh, owing to the intervention of his friends, but also just because there was a, a, a period when they were releasing some of the people before they were uh, arresting some more. You know, that, that was a, a period <coughs> when uh, Stalin sort of intervened and said, you know, too many mass arrests are happening, we have to stop this, yeah, and so on. So Masalov uh, spent eight months uh, there. This, this is where that, that camp was. This is the uh, document of, for his release. You can see he's grown a beard. And basically, um, the camp broke him. He was never the same. Um, he continued to write music, but of course he couldn't use any of his modernist style, and the music became very different. Uh, he was one, had one more major success with his harp concerto. I mean, just think about it, harp concerto. Yes, something very, very ethereal, uh, harp, yeah? Iron Foundry, from Iron Foundry to Harp. So, and the music sounds nothing like him. to hear the harp. Yes, yeah, so after that he, he basically uh, became a composer very much on the, on the second and third positions. Yeah, he was never again in the center of attention. Uh, he preferred to arrange folk music rather than write anything of his own. When he was put up for Stalin Prize, um, people said in the committee, well, he's afraid to put an extra note. Yeah, because they were basically arrangements of folk songs. And Shostakovich, who was on the committee at that time, said, well, he was never a good composer. <laughs> so, <laughs> 
which tells us something about the 20s, that he really yeah, considered Masalov his serious rival in the 20s. So, um, this brings our um, to today's lectures to the end, and I would like to introduce our performer for today, who is Simon Smith, who is a composer and a pianist who um, recorded all these CDs of very interesting uh, music, uh, specializing mostly in, in contemporary music, yeah, and also all kinds of weird music generally. Um, and I had the privilege to teach him many years ago at Cambridge, uh, so today he's going to play for us uh, Masalov's piece from 1928, which is called Turkmenian Nights. And uh, you might think, oh, Turkmenian Nights sounds nice, yeah, something based on folk music. It is based, based on folk music, but it's like nothing you've heard before, because even with folk music, yeah, he sets in his very uh, own, very abrasive style with lots of clusters. And uh, channeling what Simon told me um, just before this, it's uh, the, the three pieces of that suite are um, basically loud, louder, and loudest. <laughs> so um, uh, the, the, he hadn't gone to Central Asia at that point yet. He got these tunes from a collection. Yeah, but this is, I think, very much under the influence probably of Bartok and Stravinsky, how he decided to set them. So please welcome Simon Smith um, for the recital part of our lecture, and thank you very much for your attention. Give him a round of applause.
how many people in Russian would have heard this music? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good, simple, simple question, very difficult to answer. I think very few, actually, yeah, because um, these, um, I mean, lots of people would have heard the Iron Foundry, yeah, because it's a big piece and was performed lots of times and in many, many cities, yeah, so that became a real hit. Uh, a piece like that would have been heard by, by a much narrower circle of, circle of people. But I think it, it actually was one that traveled abroad as well. Yeah, so so the, it, it all depended basically on whether some festival um, was interested in, in your piece and it happened to be that piece. Yeah, but generally, of course, there wouldn't have been uh, such a great audience for this music. Yes, that's, that's true. Thank you. And one from the online audience about the Iron Foundry. I saw the Iron Foundry performed a few years ago, and rather than a metal sheet, as seen in the video mm -hmm. today, it was performed with a large metal anvil being struck with a mallet. Does the music give much specification on what metallic sounds should be performed? Uh, yes, I mean, I was surprised as well that, that it wasn't actually struck, because I, I remember that it was supposed to be struck, but I think it's supposed to be both struck, struck and shaken, as far as I remember the score, you know, I've seen it many, many years ago. Um, and I, I also imagine that this metal sheet should be much larger, yeah? But I suppose it was what you've got, yeah? <laughs> this was a provincial orchestra in Rostov, you know, putting this on. I think playing fantastically well. So, uh, but it still had that, yeah, because you have a combination. There's also a gong that's being struck, yeah, and at the same time, and the bass drum. So I think you still had the, the, the presence of this, like, real huge thing being, uh, being hammered, yeah, <laughs> in that piece. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, maybe one more quick mm -hmm. one. Um, a real interesting lecture, as, as usual. Who was the composer of the anti-religious symphony, and what were the circumstances of the performance that we saw? Right, so so that was Masalov, right. yeah. So anti-religious symphony, sometimes called anti-religious symphonic poem. When it was performed for the first time, it was 2017. It was a special concert organized by Orpheus Radio in Moscow for the hundredth anniversary of the Russian Revolution. Yeah, so they, they had this very special thing. It was actually broadcast on BBC. I remember that. Um, and uh, so they unearthed the, this manuscript, yeah, and prepared it. It, it, it was already, yeah, just, just never performed. Um, and it's, of course, a stunning piece uh, in, in all kinds of ways. Yeah, it, it, was, it is sound sometimes like uh, Stravinsky's Lenos at times. Yeah, it has this really kind of obsessive choral sound as well, um, and very provocative, you know, politically, uh, of course. Uh, so, um, that were the, those were the circumstances of that performance. They, they also felt they couldn't end with that, yeah, because it obviously ends with the victory of this uh, yeah, anti-religious group um, and, and these, these raucous, you know, proletarian marches. So, they actually end with a beautiful Turkmenian song, um, not like this, yeah, but actually <laughs> sung very beautifully by a soprano to create some kind of um, uh, yeah, uh, 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 lyrical emotion for people and some kind of catharsis after that. So it was very nicely, I think, staged mm. in that concert. It was definitely a very, very special event. Great. Well, I would like to thank you, Marina, for a, a wonderful lecture and Simon for a fantastic performance. Thank you very much. Thank you.